then let you uh, you take off. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, thanks everyone for for joining us today. We've got um, a terrific panel of folks to talk about uh, a very important issue, namely, how do we recover Snake River's incredible legacy of salmon and steelhead? And it's a true honor for me to get to introduce one of my heroes, um, just to embarrass Congressman Simpson. He's a, a Republican congressman from, from Idaho. He's in his 12th term in the House of Representatives for Idaho's second congressional district. Um, he's served on a number and serves on a number of very important committees in the House, uh, including the House Appropriations Committee. He's the ranking member for the Subcommittee on Energy and Water Development. He also serves on the Interior and Environment Subcommittee. These are committees that have jurisdiction over many, if not most, of the issues that uh, we care about as an organization. Um, Congressman Simpson has been a, a champion for a new energy policy for a long time. He's also, interestingly, even though he comes from a really conservative state, has been one of the more effective leaders in the Congress in terms of securing wilderness designations for really special landscapes like the Boulder White Clouds, which I think was a seven or eight year endeavor that he never gave up on. And, it, and that, that stick-to-itiveness is going to serve him well on this issue, I think, that we're going to talk about today. He also was uh, absolutely vital in, in getting additions to the Sawtooth National Recreation Area and the Jerry Peak Wilderness Area. Uh, he was first, uh, his political career began back in 1980 when he was elected to the Blackfoot City Council. He rose up to the Idaho legislature. He became the Speaker of the House in Idaho uh, before he was elected to the Congress uh, in 1998. Uh, it's, uh, he has been a friend of Trout Unlimited. He's been a friend of conservation for many years. And without further ado, Congressman Simpson, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. It's good to be with you all and thank all of you for joining and also for the work that you do. Uh, it's very important work. And today we're gonna to talk about the uh, Lower Snake River and uh, where, we, where we are and where we proceed from here. Uh, as you all know, I suspect everyone uh, on this broadcast knows about the Columbia Basin Initiative that we introduced uh, as a concept a year ago last February, or yeah, a year ago, last, yeah, Jesus, it's been, been out there for about 18 months. We, we released it just before the pandemic started, but, uh, uh, and, and uh, the complexity of it and, uh, and so forth, and it is the if it were to go into effect, it would be the largest environmental restoration program in the world. Uh, and so it, it is uh, obviously a challenge, but over the last year and a half, what we've done is been having many conversations with organizations, groups, chambers of commerce, county commissioners, uh, I, agricultural groups. I've given more talks on uh, salmon than I thought were possible, uh, but, uh, but I've enjoyed it. And uh, we knew when we were in a, when we introduced it would be kicking a, a hornet's nest uh, because the issue of dams has the dams and removal and re recovery of lower snake river salmon has been an issue for the last 25 50 years actually in idaho and the debate's been going on first time i heard about dam removal to recover salmon was back when i was speaker of the house in like 92 or 93 something like that and uh it was it was it seemed like an extreme position at the time uh, but, you know, over the last uh, 25 years, we've tried everything else to recover salmon and every fish biologist that I've talked to that has incredibility will tell you you're not going to recover salmon while those dams are there. So you're going to have to remove the dams. And we knew that that would be very, very controversial. Uh, we had hoped to get funding for this bill, which is about a 300 or about a 33 billion dollar uh, funding request. Uh, we had hoped to get that in the infrastructure package that the Biden administration was putting together or in the, the transportation uh, infrastructure bill, one of those and stuff. That didn't happen. Some people were disappointed in that and they thought, you know, okay, then it's dead. And in fact, some of my opponents thinking they've got it beat now because there's no funding in this for the infrastructure bill. But when we started on this, we never knew who was going to be president. We didn't know that there was going to be any infrastructure bill. We just looked at that as an opportunity to kind of move this forward. We're back at where I thought we would be when we first introduced it. And that is trying to convince the Pacific the people, uh, trying to convince the people of the Pacific Northwest to chart their own future uh, instead of having a judge decide it for us. And that involves uh, obviously uh, saving salmon and removing dams. I've 
been pleased to work with many different organizations, including yours, that has given us many suggestions and input into this uh, into this proposal, and uh, particularly my work uh, that we've done with the tribes. I've got to tell you, in all honesty, and I don't say that just because uh, just because they're on the line or anything. Without the work that the tribes had done over the last 25 or 30 years, maybe even longer, without that work, those salmon would be extinct today. The reason we're able to discuss this today and how we're going to save these salmon is because of the work that the tribes have done over the, over the period of time, and they deserve the credit for that. Uh, now we've got to get this across the finish line. So where do we go from here? We've got to start writing legislation, frankly, uh, and that's very complicated because it involves the BPA, it involves removal of dams, or it involves uh, fish recovery, uh, improving habitat, uh, water quality, all of those types of things. Then it, if you're going to remove the dams, uh, the dams have a benefit. You've got to replace that benefit. Power production, you've got to find different ways to, tr to transport grain and other products down the river because you're not going to have barging anymore. Uh, but I will tell you in all, this, in all honesty, and I mean this sincerely, I firmly believe those dams are coming out. Now, if it's a result of what we've done or uh, a bill that we introduced or because someone else does something, if Jay Inslee and Patty Murray get their group together and decide to take out dams, fine. I don't care what, what the motivation is as long as we get the dams removed and their snake or lower snake river restored to a free flowing river again. It's the only way you're gonna save these salmon runs. It's interesting if you poll people and you ask them just the straight question, should we remove the dams? Overwhelmingly, people say no. They go, that's crazy, you know, take out the dams that are, uh, that are uh, beneficial to the Pacific Northwest. Then you ask them just a simple question, should we recover salmon or let them go, go extinct? Overwhelmingly, people say we'll recover salmon. So we're faced with this situation of people don't want to remove dams, but people do want to recover salmon. And so it's an education process and it's going to take some time. And the challenge that we face is that it is change. You're going to have to look at things differently in the Pacific Northwest. And a lot of people, uh, well, we're human beings. We don't like change if, if, we, don't, uh, if we don't have to change. Uh, I've had one person say to me, or in fact, I've heard many people say to me, well, why do you want to disrupt a system that's working? And I look at them and say, working for who? Yes, it's working if you're barging grain. Yes, it's working if you're producing power, but it is not working if you are salmon because they are going extinct. And make no mistake about it, if you don't remove these dams, these fish will go extinct. And I don't think we're going to allow that to happen. I don't think we should allow it to happen. I have had one person say to me, well, why not just let him go extinct? You know, that's a legitimate position to have. It's one I disagree strongly with, but at least he's being honest about it. What bothers me is the people that come up to me and say, uh, I'm not going to remove the dams. I'm, you know, I'm opposed to removal of dams, but I want to save salmon as much as everybody does. If you study the science, what they're really saying is, I want to recover salmon as much as anybody does, as long as I don't have to change anything I'm doing. Well, the world is changing. And we are, we are either going to design our own future or someone's going to design it for us. I think we can do a better job designing it for ourselves and, uh, and save these magnificent fish that come into Idaho and, and how important they are in Idaho. This is where we, what we've got to do in the future, uh, I think. Uh, it's something that's being developed now uh, that I'm working on with some people that are much more knowledgeable on social media and that kind of stuff. We've got to create a snowball effect. Uh, and uh, many of you have uh, lists and social contacts, whether it's on uh, Facebook or any of the other social medias and stuff. Uh, we've got to start interacting and grow uh, the conversation and convince people that this is the right thing to do. And a lot of that convincing occurs when people who may not have an, have an opinion one way or another read your uh Facebook uh, 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 posts or your uh, your tweets, tweeters, or tweets, or <laughs> tweet, tweets and other things, uh, and read those read those comments and stuff, and they start thinking about it. And that's it, it's a complicated thing. But I'm working with some people who are obviously much smarter than uh, I am in terms of uh, social media. But we got to start a social media campaign, and it's got to be a social media campaign that that convinces. Uh, 
Governor Inslee and Patty Murray and, uh, and uh, uh, the rest of the Washington delegation and some of the Oregon delegation that it's necessary and that the public supports this. But it is truly an educational process for the next, uh, for the next few months. And that's what we're gonna be working on in terms of trying to get public support behind what we're doing and, uh, and convincing people that this is the right thing to do, that this isn't gonna change, uh, change their ability to make a living and, and other stuff. And uh, uh, that's, that's the challenge we face is, uh, is addressing change. And there's a book that was out uh, that I just read that's very interesting called Change, How to Make Big Things Happen. And uh, they talk about how uh, social media, you know, whether it's the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter or any of these other movements, how they've really grown through social media and stuff and the different types of things you can do uh, to address that and, uh, and get this snowball effect. So that's what we're going to be working on with your organizations, with other environmental organizations, with conservation organizations, with the tribes uh, and other groups uh, trying to trying to get this message out and keep the pressure on uh, to, to, uh, to make the change that I think is going to be necessary. And as I said, I firmly believe these dams are coming out. We just got to keep the pressure on doing it. Thanks, Congressman Simpson. You know, it's it's I'm going to introduce uh, Vice Chair Wheeler here in a second. It's it's remarkable to think about um, in the 1950s on the Middle Fork of the Salmon, they had a two or a three month fishing season where you could keep up to two fish per day. Yep. And today we're down to probably less than one percent of those numbers in the span of many people probably on this phone call's lifetime. The decline has been that that precipitous since those dams were built. Yeah, I uh, I've gone up and I've got a fish biologist with the uh, Forest Service that takes me and some of my staff up and in August and we go up and try to find some salmon that are spawning, and uh, we go up to Marsh Creek and Napier Creek and some other creeks in Idaho and and uh, the biologist goes out the day before and tries to find a couple that we can go see and. The people that are from there tell me it used to be those those streams were just full of salmon and, you know, uh, they're not there anymore. But we've been able to find one or two every year, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're remarkably resilient creatures and we'll have we'll have a few more questions. But let me first introduce another great uh, friend of friend of the salmon and steelhead. Uh, Shannon Wheeler was uh, first elected to serve on the Nez Perce Tribal Executive Committee, which is the governing body of the Nez Perce. Back in 2016, he has served as their chair in the past. He's their vice chair presently. Um, his bio has a terrific story, which I have to share, and I can't be embarrassing you, uh, Vice Chairman Wheeler, because it's your bio, but he's, his entrepreneurial spirit started early. At the age of five years old, he was selling vegetable soup and flower seeds in his community, which then later grew into running a larger business. And since 1990, he's been a licensed retailer uh, for the Nez Perce tribe. He's had many accomplishments as a leader for the Nez Perce. Uh, chief among those are uh, his emphasis on job creation, tribal economic development, of course, natural resource management, and preservation of the culture, history, and way of life of the Nez Perce. He's been a terrific champion. Uh, the Nez Perce have been a huge partner with Congressman Simpson and Trout Unlimited and other organizations. And Vice Chair Wheeler, it's a, it's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you for being here. Uh, good morning, thank you. Uh, definitely a pleasure to be here and, and to be with uh, Trout Unlimited and, and on the same panel with many great uh, speakers and uh, for me, uh, uh, inspirational leaders that uh, really bring the issue to the forefront, you know, Congressman Simpson, we definitely appreciate, you know, all that you've done and, and uh, trying to um, effectively uh, lay out a proposal and plan that can move the Pacific Northwest into something that's uh, far greater than what it is today. And at the same time, you know, uh, look to the, uh, look at saving the salmon species uh, here and, and especially uh, for us as Nez, Nez Perce, you know, have been subsisting off of this for thousands of years that the species that is so important, not only to us, but also to uh, the landscape as well. And when I say us, I mean us as human beings. Uh, and, and that's truly what's important, you know, is we speak to uh, the intrinsic value of, of what a salmon is. And, and I know that's a little bit more 
um, uh, vague, but uh, couldn't be more precise and, and as it uh, um, pertains to our treaty of 1855, that of course is why we're locked into this uh, so heavily is because of the fact that we did treat with the United States government at arm's length and, and secured a way of life that has those intrinsic values to it that isn't specific just to one or two fishing areas or one or two fishing sites or, or, or gathering areas, but it's that whole landscape that falls underneath that uh, umbrella of the treaty that um, has those intrinsic values of, of what a salmon means to the uh, landscape. And, and that's, that's truly what's important because if you, if you look at it, you know, the indicator species and, and the keystone species that salmon are, the, if, if they're not in the waters and, and, and uh, delivering the nutrients uh, back and forth from the ocean, then they're also going to be affecting other life sources that we have and depend on as, as we gather. And, and, you know, knowing that, you know, we all don't uh, um, depend fully on that because, you know, we, we have gardens and we have, you know, we go to Costco and all these other stores too to collect, you know, as well. Uh, but, you know, to maintain part of that culture of, of uh, what was secured is, is truly important to, uh, to the landscape as well as those gyre of nutrients that flow from the ocean and then back to the top of the mountains there is, is, is what's important because that's what made the Pacific Northwest so rich and vast with the uh, resources that it has and, and has depended on, uh, or the United States has depended on those resources for a good time now, uh, as the Nespers have for thousands of years. So, as a as a backdrop to you know why salmon are so important, that really lays it out for us. Uh, um, we understand that the importance of of that and and that way of life and and you know what was secured and and really the uh, um, part of the culture that makes us unique and makes us, you know, part of the salmon people that are, are within the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, not only the Nez Perce, but the other Columbia Basin tribes, the Salish Sea tribes that, you know, all depend on salmon or have depended on salmon for, for thousands of years have, uh, have that in common. That's that common thread that we have, that, that golden thread that, that ties us all together. And, when when that's in when that part of our culture is in trouble, then then we're in war in trouble. You know, it's it's uh, it's nice to be comprehended by people that understand why why we're in the fight, why we're why we're doing what we're doing, and to have like minds to understand that you know this should this should these salmon should be there now, and when they're not there. That disrupts who we are uh, from many different positions, not just not just one that you place the salmon on your table and, and the value of that, but these uh, other cultural values that would go along with it and uh, generally uh, go along with it uh, throughout the season. So I, I know, uh, you know, we're going to continue our efforts. Uh, you know, we we would love for this to be uh, Congressman Simpson's approach that uh, is actually the true fix for this, which is the congressional fix for the problem. Because we know we're going to, we're going to win in court. We know we're going to win in court because we have a treaty that's uh, enshrined in the constitution of the United States. And we know judges are bound by treaty. And we know we're not realizing those benefits of the treaty. Uh, in other forums, we're doing well too. I mean, in in our in our public uh, um, social media that uh, Congressman Simpson speaking of, we're just starting that too as well, and so we know we're doing well there. Uh, uh, in Congress, we would like to do a little better, and we're we're thinking that we're making ground there, and and we're going to continue those efforts and continue the outreach, not only to congressional leaders, and, uh, but also to the administration. 
and all of those federal agencies that make up the administration as well to let them know our story too as well and, and that's what's important and this the story of the salmon and how it relates to us and and where we're positioned right now and where we're uh ready to go but you know to always offer you always you have this out you have can, congressman simpson is offering it out here for a solution and that's the that's probably the easiest way for the united states to for national security for other forms of energy that uh we don't get left behind for for uh taking the uh how we grow irrigation all of these into the future all of these different transportation and and energy and our our growers that's what's important too you know because we understand like i'd mentioned previously we're not fully you know, surviving on subsistence off of our gathering, but we're also, you know, we also have, we go to the store and get tomatoes and bread and all these other products that are, that are grown. So we know the importance of that too, as well. So Congressman Simpson and, and his proposal definitely has that opportunity to take the Pacific Northwest and the United States uh, into the future and, and to the front, to the forefront of, of how we do business. And, and, you know, from an entrepreneurial background, I recognize that too as well. But also from my, the spirit within myself, that is, uh, I know that uh, the salmon are an important uh, cog in, in, in the uh, Pacific Northwest and in the landscape itself. So I, we definitely will continue our efforts and, and, and fighting for the salmon and speaking for the salmon as as we continue on. Thank you, Chairman Wheeler. Um, always Bruce? very. Yes, sir. Could I just say something? A uh, couple Please. of things, real quick. Uh, Vice Chairman Wheeler has been tremendous to work with on this. He is he is really really good at this, and and uh, I love to listen to him speak and stuff when he talked about the social media that they're doing and stuff, that's what we're trying to do is get all of us, all of you uh, to reach out because I will tell you, I've talked to a lot of legislators in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of my democratic friends from Washington and so forth have said to me, you know, I kind of like what you're doing, but I can't say that publicly because my constituents aren't behind it yet. They've got to, sh we've got to show them that there is support out there for what we're doing, because I think a majority of people actually in the long run want to save salmon. Uh, but I, I got to tell you one brief story. Earlier this year, uh, Vice Chairman Wheeler invited me to the Orca Salmon Summit uh, up in Seattle. And uh, there were tribes from the Pacific Northwest there. First morning of this summit, we listened to the tribal leaders tell their stories of salmon and so forth. It was moving. You ought to listen to these stories that, uh, that these people tell. And I came to the realization, and I told them this. I said, you know, we're, we're, we have the same goal, but we have different motives. My motives are I'm trying to, I'm trying to save a salmon, uh, trying to save a fish that I think is important both economically and environmentally, the Pacific Northwest and everything else. But as you heard uh, Vice Chairman Wheeler say, to them, this is their history, their culture, their religion, uh, and uh, it, it is a motivating uh, factor to them. We need to listen to our Native American brothers and sisters on this, uh, on some of these issues like this, because uh, they've been at this a lot longer than we have, and it is very, very important to them. So I just want to tell the chairman and vice chairman how important it was for me to get up to that Orca Salmon Summit and uh, what it meant to me and rededicated my effort to make sure we get this done because we don't give up. That's terrific. Thank you, Congressman Simpson. And thank you, uh, Vice Chair Wheeler. I just to, we only have a few minutes with Congressman Simpson and, and Chairman Wheeler before they before we begin the broader panel and they have other things to do. But Vice Chairman Wheeler, you talked about the uh, Treaty of 1855 and talk to us a little bit about how removing the four Lower Snake River dams will help the U.S. to meet its treaty obligations to the Nez Perce Nation. 
Thank you for that question. And it's uh, definitely one that, uh, you know, we take a, a really good hard stance on as of, of our treaty and, and being able to uh, determine and, uh, and I guess the, the word that, the words that I'm looking for is to be able to interpret what that treaty means because we're the ones that can interpret from the Nez Perce side of, of what this tre treaty means to us. And, and so as we look to interpret that as, as our people would have understood it in 1855, we understand it that in that same way today uh, for the values that uh, aren't being realized. And when these values aren't being realized, we look to the issues that have been, that are changing what are, is, a, is supposed to be happening uh, in our way of life. And if the salmon aren't happening, then we're doing restoration work, we're doing uh, habitat work, you know, we, we're fixing uh, stream channels and, and riparian areas. We're doing many different things. We're, we're, we're uh, you know, we're a part of the uh, 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 spill operations. We're part of the cold water infusion from Dwarshack. I mean, there's just a plethora of things that the tribe has been doing in order to help the salmon uh, migrate and to and from the ocean are these nutrients to and from the ocean. And when that isn't happening, when we've, uh, you can just look at it, we're turning this dial, we're turning this dial, we're turning all these different dials to make salmon come back. And we're like, you know, we've, we've done pretty much all we can do right now and continue to do just to keep these, this species alive or that's all alive. And the problem is right there. It's right in front. It's the elephant in the room. It's right there. That's what the problem is. And so when we're not being able to realize our uh, expectations of our treaty, which we can interpret, then the problem, and we're saying the problem is, is dams. And we know ocean conditions are a part of it. Possibly overfishing was a part of it early on. But right now, the, the, the largest problem is the dams and the migration of, of, and survival of the juveniles uh, heading to the river. And then the warming waters of the, of the river coming back are the, well, we don't even call them rivers anymore. We call them lakes. And they all, the Army Corps has, you know, had the audacity of, of naming these lakes instead of keeping them uh, the Snake River. But that's what's, that, that's the issue uh, with uh, the dams is, is we've done, we've turned all these other dials and, and, and we have the most pristine areas uh, in the wilderness that are already you know, the survival rate of the salmon coming down the river uh, before they hit the uh, um, reservoir. And then that's where the issues start. We're not having problems with them migrating from, from uh, the rearing ponds or, or in, in the wilderness, getting back, getting down to here. It's, it's, that's where the issues start. And, and so those are the things that we can control. We can't control uh, the ocean conditions right now. We're, we haven't been able to control you know, uh, global warming, but we can control uh, the dams. And so that's, that's the issue. That's, you know, it's like fixing anything. You start with the things that are smallest first, which was the riparian areas, the habitat and, and the flow of the water. And, and if that isn't working well, then you go to the next thing. And so that's where the dams are. Dams are the next thing. You know, I'm sure ocean conditions will be another thing that will be the, the, the next generation's uh, issue to solve. And uh, but we can prepare them and try to solve what we can here, and and that's the that's how our treaty of the treaty obligation of the federal government and its agencies, congressional leaders like Congressman Simpson, the administration like the Biden Harris administration, uh, must uphold their uh, treaty obligations to the tribe by observing that our treaty rights aren't being realized. Therefore. Therefore, their obligation to us and the promise to us 
for us ceding 13 million acres to the United States of America uh, needs to be covered by those people that are um, uh, charged with uh, honoring that treaty. Thank you, Vice Chairman Wheeler. And I want to be sensitive to, to the fact that I know both of you have to leave soon, but Congressman Simpson, two, two questions, and some of these have already come up in, in some of the chats. So the first is, um, do you have a sense of timing? This is going to be a really complex bill to write. Do you have a sense of timing for when you and Congressman Blumenauer, who we should mention, a Democrat from Oregon, um, is agreed to work with you on this bill? Do you have a sense of timing for when you might introduce a bill? No, I don't. Uh, we're gonna. And my chief of staff and I have been kind of debating how do you write this bill because it is big and complicated when you consider everything that it deals with. And we've decided that what you probably do is take it piece by piece. Uh, do the Bonneville Power Administration part of it first, then do something else first. You know, uh, after that, and and get it in pieces because I think it's too big of a pie to eat all at once but you got to get the pieces put together and then introduce it as a bill. Uh, and so that's going to take us a little time to, to do that. We haven't started writing yet. We've just been having these discussions. We know we've got to get on with it because it's a little hard to go out and sell a concept uh, without having, and I think members of Congress, I know I, if I'm going to support an idea or something, I want to see exactly what I'm supporting or, or opposing. Uh, so trying to get it into a bill form so that people can actually see it, uh, I think is the important thing, but it's going to take a few months to do that, several months to do that probably. All right. Well, again, I want to, I want to thank you, Congressman Simpson and Vice Chairman Wheeler. You are, uh, we would welcome uh, both of you uh, continuing to stay and participate. Um, the leadership that you have demonstrated on this uh, thorny issue has been nothing short of remarkable, both of you. And uh, I want you to know on behalf of TU's 300,000 members and supporters, uh, you both are heroes of our organization, and we stand uh, ready to be shoulder to shoulder with you to help uh, get this, this bill across the finish line. Uh, so thank you, and uh, we, again, please welcome to stay, but let me introduce the rest of our, our panel. Uh, Keilani Scott is the communication manager for the Nez Perce tribe. Uh, she's a, a Spokane tribal member, and she's also a Nez Perce descendant. Keilani, welcome. Uh, Steve Moyer is our Vice President for Government Affairs. He actually hired me at Trout Unlimited. He's been with TU since 1992. Um, and uh, Steve, we're looking to, forward to hearing from you. Helen Neville is our lead scientist. Dr. Neville has been with TU for, I think, 15 or so years now, 13 years. And um, uh, she's a geneticist by training, but uh, well, well steeped in uh, these salmon and steelhead issues. Helen, welcome. Eric Crawford is an organizer for us in uh, uh, North uh, uh, Idaho. Um, he worked for the Department of Fish and Game in Idaho for 20 years. Uh, Eric, we're, we're really pleased that you're here today as well. Maybe all of you can unmute unless you have background noise that you're worried about. And I'll just uh, move right down the line and just ask a series of questions. And we'll let's see how the conversation flows for the next 25 minutes or so. Keilani, I'll start with you if that's okay. Um, you know, tell us about your, your personal experience and about how Northwest tribes have been working on the, these issues. Chairman Wheeler had a very interesting analogy, you know, turning dials. Uh, but tell us about your own personal experience on this issue and, and that of the tribes working. Well, certainly it's, um, you know, it's been interesting how things develop and, and the different type of work that has to be done in order to accomplish these goals. Um, and when I started working for the tribe just a few years ago, I, I fortunately got to kind of dive into some of the work that our employees are doing, the groundwork. Um, and, you know, and as Vice Chair Wheeler had mentioned with the uh, redeveloping streams um, so that the fish can return to their natural spawning grounds or even just uh, creating shade because the waters are getting so warm. Um, and these projects, they take so long and they're extremely expensive, you know, but one example, we just had a stream that was the construction and reparations of it were just completed. And the very next day, uh, the fish were returning. So, I mean, that goes to show they're ready. They want to come home. They want to, you know, they want to get back to their natural grounds and it's just been a challenge. And so here we are trying to, trying to make it work, trying to figure out how to make these things happen. Uh, another example, 
not too long ago, I got to follow some of our, our staff on one of their journeys where they drove all the way to the Columbia River, filled these tanks with the, the small fish and drove them all the way back up to the salmon um, over at Pittsburgh Landing. You think about how many miles that is just to transport these fish so they can get back to doing what they need to do and all the risks that come along with that. You know, and again, these are all the things that we're trying to do just to mitigate to ensure their survival. And yet we're still seeing these decline in numbers. But then you go back even further and you have that boots on the ground work. I don't know how many stories I've heard about uh, different tribal members that have literally had to fight for their rights. You know, I've heard my dad talk about just as a young boy trying to fight for his rights uh, with his mom being such an advocate for it and telling him, this is important. You're gonna have to do this in order to continue your way of life. These are the things you have to do. So you think about all of the work that tribal members are doing. And I'm pretty sure any tribal member you ask, uh, salmon is a top priority and for several, for several reasons. So the work continues and we're finding more and more that it, you know, it's before it was a lot of that on the ground um, you know, doing those type of things. And now it's more than that. It's having these conversations. It's speaking to, to other folks that maybe have different opinions and, and under, having an understanding of why this isn't so important and not just for us, but it's, it's, it's huge. It's important for everybody. Um, so it really just develops and the work continues. And, you know, while we continue this work, uh, the other folks are continuing their work with more of that, the reparations and, um, doing around the clock hours. <laughs> we had another example where an employee, um, you know, they're on call 24 seven just to keep an eye on those fish because they're not in their natural habitats when they're in these hatcheries. And so we're doing the best we can to ensure their safety and survival, but that requires somebody being on call 24 seven to make sure temperatures are right, there's no predators and, and so on. Um, so I think anyways, just a few examples of, of what we've, we've done and what we continue to do to try and make this work with what we have right now. Thanks, Kehlani. That's very powerful. And there's something that's just utterly sad about thinking about having to uh, put small baby salmon into a truck and to barge them down, to drive them down on a highway to, uh, to get back into the Columbia. That just, just doesn't feel right. But we appreciate the efforts of the Nez Perce very, very much. Helen, how much time do we have? Um, you know, we've seen these, these fish are at historically low numbers. I'm going to ask Eric, Eric in a moment to update us on Idaho's numbers this year. But just from your scientific perspective, that of you and your colleagues, not to put you on the spot, Helen, but how much time do you think we have before these fish go extinct? I mean, I think that, that's a really hard thing to predict precisely. Um, I will say that we are in dire straits, as you noted. You know, these numbers are at historic lows. They are, for the most part, in returning at much lower numbers than they were when they were listed under the Endangered Species Act back in the 1990s. Um, the Nez Perce put out a very jarring report this, this summer showing that many of our stocks are functionally extinct. Um, some of the populations are considered functionally extinct. Spring, summer, Chinook have all been declining precipitously. Um, we, we know they are at rates around extinction, bouncing around extinction right now. So whether that occurs in the next five years, 50 years, you know, is, is really hard to predict. I think the one thing that we all have to remember and be inspired and amazed by is the resilience of these fish. You know, they've, they've evolved in a landscape over millions of years um, that has been dynamic. They have suffered volcanoes, landslides, fires, floods, and they have strategies to deal with that with their diverse life histories where some are out in the ocean at certain times of year, some are in the, you know, they have multiple combinations of where they are when that helps buffer these populations from these kinds of impacts. But the problem is their strategies depend on a connected system and the ability to access different habitats at different times. And so we've Kind of taken away their main coping mechanism in being able to function like that. So um, I think they're they're amazingly resilient, but they're really literally hitting up against these concrete structures now. And, and we are hitting a time where, you know, in combination with ocean conditions, like Vice Chairman Wheeler mentioned earlier, you know, we're in a downturn that that they could blink out imminently um, if we don't get these dams out. 
but it's hard it's hard to put a specific number on exactly when that might happen thanks helen that's a political scientist asking a uh, political science major asking a scientist a question um <laughs> our mutual friend russ uh, describes these fish as mariners and mountaineers because they, they quite literally uh, connect the sawtooth to the Pacific Ocean. It's a it's a remarkable thing to think about. Eric, uh, I know last year we were really worried about the past several years. We've been really worried about that fabled uh, V run of steelhead in Idaho. Uh, larger fish, hardier fish. We've been in steep decline. How's the steelhead run doing uh, this year? Yeah. So Chris, um, I, I think it, you need a little bit of perspective to really grasp where we are. And so as Helen and, and everybody else has, has noted, you know, the steelhead are, is threatened. That occurred all the way in 1997. And so if you go back through the chronicles of dam counts um, and look at the 10 year average prior to listing, um, so 1987 to 1996, at Lower Granite, 23,716 steelhead were counted. So this year, during that same time period, July 1 to September 27th, 15,046 steelhead have been counted. So that really puts it in perspective after, you know, um, 25 years of being listed um, as threatened, we still can't get good returns back. Um, to make it even more dire, those list listed species are wild fish, right? So, um, the overall number that I gave is, is primarily hatchery counts, uh, hatchery returns. But if we look at the even the, the wild fish returns, um, as of yesterday, 4,419 wild steelhead passed lower granite. Again, in that same time period, July 1 to September 27th, in 1996, the year before they were listed, 4,798 steelhead crossed. So, you know, I think as, as everybody is alluding to, you know, what we're doing right now is not working. The only solution to get better survival, um, as Congressman Simpson pointed out, um, the science shows that the removal of the four lower snake uh, dams is necessary to increase these survival rates. Thanks, Eric. You know, I have a, a, a lasting memory from around 96. I was working for the Forest Service as a seasonal employee and we were snorkeling streams in Idaho doing paired watersheds, looking at watersheds that have been developed versus those that were undeveloped. And I was snorkeling a stream way up in the uh, south fork of the Salmon River drainage. And I came around, you know, a couple thousand feet in elevation, 700 miles from the ocean. And I was snorkeling in the river and I came around a bend and there were two steelhead, you know, finning gravels right in front of me. And to this day, perhaps aside from the birth of my children, it rem remains uh, one of the most powerful images I've ever seen. Steve, there's a lot of people asking questions about, uh, wake up, Steve. There's a lot of people asking questions about steps that they can specifically take. Uh, so maybe a two-part question for you, Steve. What, what can we ask people to do uh, to, to help convince uh, their legislators in the Pacific Northwest in particular, but really everywhere, uh, to take action? And based on your experience on Capitol Hill, Steve, what do you think it will take to motivate action on Congressman Simpson's initiative. Thanks, Chris. If I could, I just say, I wanna tap into uh, the hopefulness of this discussion first to, to, to set up my answer to you. And even though Helen and Eric have given some really tough numbers and a tough assessment, you know, we need to hear that. We need to understand where we are and face up to it squarely. And just know that politics is about being hopeful and finding a path forward, you know, the art of the possible. Uh, TU helped to get the Elwha dams removed. That required a piece of legislation to pass Congress. We had to find several hundred million dollars to remove the Elwha dam. We got the Penobscot project done in Maine. We had to come up with $60 million where we didn't know where we we're gonna find that. Uh, we did that. Uh, and now we're working on the Klamath, uh, and, you know, a much bigger project, but a lot of stakeholders are, are very committed to that getting done. So just pointing out that TU and, and uh, the tribes and others have faced up to very difficult challenges, a lot like this one, on a smaller scale, of course, uh, but we figured out a way to get it done. And uh, you know that's the hopefulness I wanna make sure we, we leave with our listeners and participants because um, it's just the same, same thing, only on a bigger and a tougher scale, but we've done it before. So uh, I wanna 
also highlight that, uh, as Mr. Simpson said, we have everybody in the Northwest committed to saving salmon, right? Nobody is against salmon. They want to save salmon. So even the Democrats who have not uh, embraced Mr. Simpson's plan as much as we would have wanted yet are very favorable to saving salmon and have demonstrated that generally throughout their careers. Uh, we've just got to remind them that there's no way else to save salmon here on the snake but to remove the dams. Also, everybody in the Northwest is committed to the fulfilling the, tr the treaty rights that Mr. Wheeler talked about, everybody. And again, we have, to, we have to show people and remind them there's no way else to do that unless you remove the dams. And finally, this, the whole idea of infrastructure upgrades, again, everybody's for it. Build back better. What a great concept. Uh, we got to show the, the Biden administration that there's a great opportunity here to build back better, help the tribes, and save the salmon. So we just have to make those arguments in a compelling fashion. And, and now to your question, uh, you know, we, we have to get our members and supporters and all our allies to do that in a more unified and a louder fashion than we've done so far. The social media uh, campaign that Mr. Simpson talked about, I think is absolutely right. We have to get that going. We've got to meet with them. We've got to take them out to the Snake River watershed and show them uh, where the salmon could be if the dams were removed uh, and basically make it an imperative for the members of the Northwest to make this a priority. That's what we have not done yet. Mr. Simpson gave us a great opportunity and showed us the way how to make it a priority. And we've just got to be in unison and loud and forceful uh, in, in making it a priority. Um, again, just tying back, we've done it a number of times in the past. Uh, you know, we just got the Bristol Bay uh, saved uh, in large part from the Pebble Mine convinced the Trump administration to deny the permit. Uh, we can accomplish big things if we're unified and loud and focused. And so that's, uh, you know, that's what I would have to say. Thanks, Steve. And just on that Elwha Dam, so that dam was, those dams were taken out a couple of years ago. We had a few TU staff that went over there and snorkeled uh, just last year. And there was a big fight about whether or not we'd need to build a hatchery to have steelhead replenish up in the Elwha. And they went back up in there and they snorkeled to some of the sections that were now accessible that had been previously blocked by uh, the dams. And they found over 300 pair of spawning steelhead. And so what happened was that resident rainbow trout, they recovered their anadromy. They literally remembered how to run back out to the ocean and to replenish that stock. These are, to go back to what Helen said, these are incredibly resilient fish. If we give them half a chance, they will come back. Eric, maybe you could uh, just give people a sense of the habitat in Idaho. Why is it that scientists predict that by 2080, 65% of all of the available salmon habitat in the West Coast will be in Idaho? So most of that is related to this high elevation habitat that we do have, um, coupled with um, some serious and significant land protections throughout the basin. Um, namely uh, the Frank Church, uh, the Middle Fork of the Salmon, um, as well as the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness um, affords us very, very large protections. But I think the, the most interesting thing is, is that the portion of the Snake River Basin that uh, uh, embraces anadromy and anadromous uh, species is roughly 49,000 square miles. Um, you start to look at uh, the East Coast, and what that really means as far as land mass. And so we can look at New Jersey, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, and only come up with 45,000 square miles. So that really tells you, yeah, thanks Shannon for uh, showing a perspective there. Yeah, <laughs> it, it really is, is unbelievable, uh, the amount of habitat that is still available, that is still, still accessible. Um, you know, in total, there's about 8,200, um, river miles of occupied uh, salmon and steelhead habitat in the Snake River Basin. Um, in comparison, it's 2,800 miles from Seattle to New York City. So you're gonna have to do that trip three times to really be able to appreciate the amount of habitat that is currently occupied. And let's hope that it stays occupied. 
Um, that's the big thing. And so that is why we as an organization push so hard to um, provide this free flowing uh, lower Snake River for access to the Snake River Basin. Just the sheer immensity of the of, of it, the amount of habitat and its uh, position in the future. Thanks, Eric. That's tremendous perspective. Keilani, I wonder if from, from your perch as a communications person, what, what can we do at Trout Unlimited to help uh, work with the Nez Perce uh, with the cause? Thanks, Chris. We have been doing our due diligence to really get the word out there, get people informed and educated. Uh, most recently, just last week, we launched our new campaign, which is the Salmon Orca Project. Um, with that, we have created a new website, which is salmonorcaproject.com, and that includes social media with Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're really trying to amplify and elevate our voice there, uh, working with our partners, getting out those messages. We have created a call to action so folks can write letters um, and get that information to their congressional leaders. Um, and so that's really been our big push lately is getting that information out there because Congressman Simpson's right. And that's, folks need to be made aware. Um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what this really means and what this would mean for our surrounding regions. Um, so that's been our big push lately. That website has a lot of great information. Um, we've put out several press releases. There's been several articles and those are listed there. Talks more about this, the multiple tribes that are involved in this, um, you know, talking about the Salmon Orca Summit. We had several leaders speak on what this means to them, what salmon means to them, um, and even the stories about those tribes that no longer have access to salmon and what they've had to endure um, with that loss. So I think that's really big, our big push lately. And so I encourage folks to check that out and um, support it where you can, and we'll keep moving forward with that one. Thanks, Kaylani. We'll make that website available to everyone on the call today, everyone who signed up for the call. Helen, you wrote a terrific uh, column about the shifting baseline syndrome, which I know is not a theory that you came up with, but talk about shifting baselines in the context of salmon recovery. What does it mean for us with the salmon numbers today, knowing what they were historically, or maybe you could help us understand that perspective. Yeah, it really, it captures this um, concept of human nature that we all gauge what is around us at the time of our life. Um, and that, that translational knowledge across generations is so hard to retain in a real way. And I think that's why the, the perspective of the Nez Perce and their traditions and their culture passing this information along is so important to all of us. But you know, those of us who grow up right now have a certain rate of fish that are coming back now. And we might think of, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago as what we expect from fish returns in Idaho. Um, and then it's easy to see, well, they might have declined a little bit, but not understand the magnitude of where we are today when you compare this to the vast numbers that we had historically, right? So we all as a culture tend to sort of correct our view to where we are now and then calibrate everything to that instead of where we have been in the past as our expectation for what could be. And you even hear with, about, about this with the agencies, you know, we see outreach about numbers have increased, you know, they, we've, we've had a huge increase in the last two years, but that's an increase bouncing around extinction. So what they're looking at is these little tiny bumps around, around this, you know, terribly low and dangerous numbers where they might go up a year or two, but you know, overall we are not at the healthy returns the fishable harvest, the, you know, getting them off the extinction list, but the fishable harvestable numbers that everyone is hoping for. And it's really important to step back and, and honor and think about that history of where we have been in the past, the numbers that these fish are able to produce if we give them a chance. The habitat we have here in Idaho, um, the nutrients that, that Chair, Vice Chairman Wheeler talked about, you know, the the functional ecosystem as we restore all that could be tremendous. But it's important to realize that human nature will focus on where we are right now and not think about that long-term, you know, remarkable view. Thanks, Helen. Uh, we're heading toward the top of the hour and I wanna give our two esteemed guests, uh, Vice Chair Wheeler and Congressman Simpson, the last word if, if they would like to take advantage of that. Uh, Vice Chairman Wheeler, any, anything to offer for us or Congressman Simpson? Since you got off mute first, you can go first. I got off mute first. 
Uh, thank you, Chris. And thanks to all of your membership for everything that you do. Uh, we're in this for the long haul. Uh, we're going to make this happen. Uh, and, but it's going to take a lot of work on all of our behalf uh, in, in making it happen. And uh, I am uh, so proud of the work that we've been able to do so far together in, in advancing this cause. Uh, we cannot we cannot let these fish go extinct. It is, we can design our future or someone else will design it for us. I think we can design it and do a better job of it, uh, working together. Uh, and it's just a matter of getting people to understand that change is not a bad thing. You know, we can do things differently. Everything we do on the lower Snake River and Columbia River, we can do differently if we choose to do it. We can find different way to get uh, to get uh, products to market. We can find different ways to produce energy. We can find different ways to recreate. We can do all of that kind of stuff. It's what we choose to do. Salmon don't have a choice. They need a river. And right now, as Vice Chairman Wheeler said, they don't have a river. They got a series of pools uh, that are harming them and making them go extinct. So, thanks for all that you do. I look forward to working with you in the coming months as we uh, as we try to put together some legislation and. Uh, and then I'm sure we'll be doing this again once we get it put together. So thanks, Chris. Thank you, sir. Vice Chair Wheeler, you get the last word, sir. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, d I definitely appreciate, you know, uh, all of the uh, friends and, and allies in, in this endeavor and this uh, uh, charge to save salmon. And, and that's really what who the Nez Perce are. And we're, we're charged with that with the honoring our ancient covenant that we have with the salmon, you know, as, as they give themselves to us in, in our beginnings, in our, in our stories. And when they, when they lost their voice, we were to become their voice. And now is the time that, especially now at this time that we have to be their voice and we'll continue to, uh, push forward in, in all forums, in all forums. We'll continue to, to work with Congressman Simpson. We'll continue to reach out to the, to the uh, uh, White House and to the administration, uh, work with federal agencies, local uh, uh, um, farmers and, and irrigators and, and reaching out to all of them to have a conversation, have a conversation with us. How else are you going to get to know your neighbor unless you go have a conversation with them and understand, you know, our position. And, and we definitely want to understand your position. And so those conversations need to happen and they're going to happen and they are happening. And uh, we're going to continue those efforts uh, and until the salmon are, are back and we have done our job of, of speaking for the salmon. And that's exactly what, what the Nest First Tribe intends to do. So thank you for this time and this opportunity to uh, share um, a perspective from the Nest First with you. Thank you, Vice Chair Wheeler. Those are perfect words to send us out. And Keilani, Helen, Eric, Steve, uh, thank you uh, folks very much as well. Uh, this concludes our, our session. We appreciate you all very much. Let's keep fighting. Bye-bye. <laughs>